Hello! Today I'm going to be making a video I've been meaning to make for a while, and one of the actual key reasons I started this YouTube experiment. It's going to be how I make these radio brackets from scratch without the use of the template I've already created. I'm actually going to be recreating the full template and this entire bracket from scratch in a single take. and basically just go build this USL bracket again. This is from the 2017 USL playoffs. So we have a nice easy bracket to recreate. We had eight teams in two conferences, 16, eight, four, two, one. This is not an Inkscape file. As you can see, no groups to ungroup in selection. So I can't cheat and use these pieces again. We're gonna build it entirely from scratch. So the first step I always do is create a background image. And for this, all we really need is a rectangle. And my standard proportions are 2000 by 1500. And we're just going to resize our Inkscape drawing. And then we need to start drawing a whole lot of circles. And while I'm working on this, a quick explanation. I use a lot of macros in Inkscape. I have the G Skill gaming mouse, they only make one. There are two buttons along each side. Under my thumb, I have set the arrow cursor tool and the color picker tool, very convenient to switch between. And then I have an alignment tool here. And then I have a Sweet 16 keypad from 1UP Keyboards. This is a little kit. I actually soldered it myself. This is set with the Align and Distribute functions. So in Inkscape, which is normally over here. I use a lot of these all the time. And this is a very convenient way to streamline the workflow so I can keep stuff like colors and transform tools open. And yeah. This is a very handy little keypad. I think the whole kit is $35, and for Inkscape, it's been absolutely fantastic. So, to get started, we need to start drawing our circles. And I've played around with this a lot, and I find that if you use a 200 base and then increment by 300, you can end up with really nicely spaced... Uh, features and we'll just use red and green as some placeholder colors for now. So it's 200, 500, 800, 1100, and 1400 pixels relative. And because Inkscape is vector, it doesn't really matter what I'm drawing at. I can create a final product as big as I please. And we're going to get pretty close here. This is just a nice way to start mapping out what we're going to be doing. And you'll see already very similar sizes. So all we're actually going to use in this process is stuff built into Inkscape. The path tools, the shape drawing tools, and some alignment. And a bit of math to get up with our brackets and some of our angles. But that's it. Very, very straightforward process. So, the first thing I always like to build is this white outline superstructure. This is always kept as a separate layer above the physical bracket. I find that that works really well, and it's easy to build from this. So, we're just going to make a quick copy of this, duplicate it, and we'll move it off to the side, and we'll get to work over here. So... What I do is I just add 25 pixels to each circle. So 14, 25 from 1400 and, oh, whoops. We need end, not delete. And do that. And I'm going to use, let's use blue as just a temporary placeholder color here. So same thing. Plus 25 and Inkscape just lets you add on the tools or add on your measurements while you're working makes this very very easy so I can just hit and plus 25 
and move my shapes around. Let's see, here we go. And I know there are more efficient ways I could be doing my layers here, but this works well for me and honestly don't have much of a reason to change. So we've got now one, two, three, four, five blue circles, one, two, three, four, five radial rings. And now we're just going to use these, making sure that everything is perfectly aligned. We're going to use the path difference tool to cut circles out of other circles and just go through all of our blue rings, which will become our outline, and cut away the bigger shapes in the middle. And we are left with a 12.5 pixel continuous round outline around the entire bracket, which is pretty much perfect. So now we've got this, and what I do next is I use the path union tool, and we'll make this white now while we're working. This is now exactly what we want. If I were to move this over top of the bracket image, and we'll go and set the color to something nice and bright like yellow. And we can see that it is pretty much perfectly aligned. Excellent. So next step is to add in those lines. And I'm just gonna do that with the rectangle tool. So already, we know that there's 150 pixels difference from these rings if we were to look at the radius. And so doing that basic math, 150 minus 12.5 gives us 137.5 as this inner diameter all the way in until this middle piece, which is 200. So next step, rectangle tool, we need 12.5 pixels and we need 150 pixels per ring. So we'll do, we'll do the top and bottom first, set the width to 12.5, and we will set the height for the top and bottom. It stretches three rings here, which means 450 pixels, 450, and we'll use this as blue. So we're going to center it at the top like that. And you'll notice that this is actually perfectly aligned just on that middle point here, and it only just touches on this inner ring, that point in the middle as well. All we really need to do is just move it down. Since we only care about the space between the rings, it doesn't matter that the sizing isn't quite, or the alignment isn't quite perfect with the rings. It honestly doesn't, and it will make no difference by the end. So we're just going to make another one down here, move it up. And then we're going to do the left and right hand rings. So just rotate this. We're going to drop this to 300 pixels. We're going to align it on the left side centered. Same thing as before, just move it in a little bit. And one more on the right hand side and move it in a little bit as well. And then we're going to just use that path union tool again, give us one solid shape. And we're almost done. Now we just have one, two, three, four more offset at a 45 degree angle. And the easiest way to do that is just to rotate the bracket and then use the top, bottom, left, and right alignments again. So 12.5, 150 because we only need to cover one. And then we're just going to take this whole shape and we're going to rotate it 45 degrees and start getting back to work. Bottom. Just move that a few pixels in, do the same thing on the come on on the top and move that a few pixels in. And then we're gonna just take this again, rotate it 90 degrees on the left side, center it, move this in again, and on the right side, move this in again. Very straightforward. And now, once again, path union tool, create one solid path, and we have a very nice clean outline. So then we're just going to take this and 
rotate it back. I'll set this to a dark gray for a second and align it over here so you can see what I'm talking about. And it lines up pretty much perfectly. You'll see a few gaps in the spacing. That's mainly a quirk of how Inkscape handles circles and is something I honestly, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, but it's, it's what are you gonna do? It's kind of hard to, uh, to get it to look perfectly correct. So what we're going to do now is we need to start creating our wedges. And for each layer, we need 16, then 8, then 4, then 2. And just some basic circle math. 16 means our offset is 22.5 degrees. 8 is 45. 4 is obviously 90. 2 is 180. Basic geometry. There are a couple of different ways you can make these individual wedges. What I tend to prefer is actually taking this circle here and then what was the outline circle here and cutting it. I find that that gives a very nice clean cut. So what we're going to do is make a 1400 pixel circle and then we're going to make one that is 1125 pixels. We'll just use these colors for the time being. And then once they're aligned perfectly, I go in and I adjust the circles with the angle tool here to create the, an arc. So 270 will start at the top and then we just need to do 270 plus 22.5. And then we do the exact same thing here, 270, 270 plus 22.5. And now we have these two shapes. So all we really need to do now is just cut these and clone them. So what we're going to do now is give ourselves some stuff to work with here. We're going to trim this back. I usually do like a hundred pixel circle. We'll make it a nice bright color and we're just going to duplicate this circle here, restore it, and then we're going to set a stroke and no fill. And then we're going to align this centered in here. This means that while we're rotating stuff, it'll be nice and clean and easy to work with. And since this is now perfectly aligned with this, we can actually make this a little bit bigger. Let's, let's do 1500 and we'll align it again. And so all we're going to do now is cut these two shapes apart with the path difference tool. We're going to duplicate it make a group of these two shapes and then add in our wedge and then we're just going to set it to rotate by 22.5 and start making some wedges and this will give us enough to work with the alignment isn't going to be totally perfect. Inkscape's got a few quirks in its path cutting tools that I've noticed over the years working with these. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it other than just optimize the way you're cutting your circles up. This will end up looking good enough. That's the best that I can say. It's, it's not going to be perfect but we're going to use our outline to hide some of our mistakes and generally just it's a little bit lazy but it works so now we have this ring of 16 wedges and we're just going to grab those out of here and start we actually don't really need these in this middle piece anymore so we're going to put these over here we'll make this a nice bright we'll make this a nice bright fuchsia looking color put this in here and when we bring our outline to the top it starts to build our structure so this is what I'm talking about with some of these little gaps and that's mainly just down to how Inkscape cuts up circles there are ways to mitigate this a bit but it's it's not even perfectly consistent as you go around it's a little bit dodgy but let's actually measure this and I can show you exactly what I'm talking about here which is bring this all the way up we're going to use our 
path tool to just measure this. And as you see, it is 0.29 pixels there in the bottom bar there. So when I render this at double the size, it is 0.6 of a pixel, half of a pixel in a graphic that's going to be 4,000 pixels wide by 3,000 pixels tall. Negligible. What we can really do is just be lazy, take our outlines, give this a tiny little bit of a stroke of, we're only going to add on, let's add on an extra half a pixel. And you'll see already it's getting rid of that gap pretty handedly. And if we add on a full pixel outline and drop it down to the bottom and just set up the hiders correctly, We'll make that outline the pink, drop it down, and all of those errors are gone without it severely affecting the overall look of the bracket. Perfect. So, time to finish out our wedges, and we're just going to do the exact same thing we've done already. We're going to grab the shapes we need here. And we'll actually be using these again at the base of everything as a little filler to help keep some of the lines from showing through. You'll probably see on this capture this little white line here and all throughout there. If we put in something underneath that is just a nice dark neutral color, it'll, uh, it'll get rid of a lot of that. And once it starts getting colored in, it's barely noticeable on the final render. So put you back over there. And oh, so that's just the same color I use for my background layer. Let's make that green again. Here we go. So we've got these two circles again. We're going to put them in our little rotation tool, drop them down. Not that far. And we're going to add on to this one here, 25 pixels. We're going to align it again. And then we're going to run our same angles with this tool starting at 270 and then 270 plus 45, 270, 270 plus 45. There we go. Path difference. And now we have this again, and we are going to need eight of these. So we make eight copies, group it with the middle, rotate, set to 45, and just build it up again. There are ways I could be doing this using something like HTML5 or JavaScript or any number of a little bit more code heavy solutions. I personally find it not that necessary. I actually like building with Inkscape. I think it gives me a lot more flexibility on making changes later. And we're now just gonna drop this guy in here and do the same thing again, one more step in. Duplicate these, align them here. Looks like our little rotation tool needs to be regrouped. There we go. Take this one, add another 25 pixels, align, and cut it down again. So we just need to do 270, and it's automatically going to end at zero, giving us a perfect 90 degree arc. And there we go. And then we're going to just cut that again. And two, three, four group, set our rotation to 90. You can just do these rotating the shapes individually, but this fills out your bracket for you as you go, which is just handy. And we grab these, throw them in the bracket. And the last two is our 180 degree wedges. Put these in here, same thing as before, and plus 25 center. Then we're going to set both of these to start at 270 and end at 90. Oh, they do not want to do that. Let's do them individually then. 270, 90. 
and really we can just uh, cut this here and rotate this entire shape then 180 degrees temporarily group it together boink and we now have our semicircular wedges for the middle so if we bring this up to the top we'll see all of our slices are where they need to be and so the idea behind my bracket design is that when two teams have their colored wedges directly adjacent those two teams will play each other in that round of playoffs when there is a line in between those teams will not play each other. Those are delineating different games and different rounds. I like the way this looks. I've done some additional addendums and changes with the NBA and NHL brackets, and I'll actually show some of those and uh, show how I made some of those here in a moment. So now we're just gonna take these, and what I like to do is just alternate the colors with two neutral shades of gray. So we're going to do something like a 50% gray and a 40% gray. It's close enough that they're still distinguishable while I'm working and while filling in the bracket later. It's 40 and 50. It's, it's not too hard to tell those two colors apart. And we're just going to do the same thing again with the next ring. Set them to this color and set these to this color. I have a lot of people asking when I post these online, especially in the early rounds of playoffs, what do these colors mean? They really mean nothing. They're just there for my own benefit later and to show the rough paths a team could take to make it to a championship game. And we do need our center ring. Make another copy and put you in here. And we'll make you this color gray. And yeah, those are easily distinguishable while also not being uh, just too obnoxious and colorful while we're working. And we're actually going to be uh, changing this color here. Oh, this is still a uh, lovely bit of gap here. How much more is this? Let's go and measure you. What we got here. Let's do that, and that, and that. And we'll just we'll kind of eyeball it. That's half a pixel, so that's going to be a full pixel gap when we're done. Uh, I may just end up tweaking the outline a little bit more, because as you can see, it's even though it is perfectly centered and all of these are aligned correctly, like if I go and highlight everything that isn't the outline, we're going to end up with exactly 1400 by 1400. We're just losing a little bit of... Uh, distance here and there on some of these wedges but it is so small that I honestly don't really care yeah half a pixel that's one pixel wide and again we can just cover that up by adding like another two point we'll make this outline 2.5 and center it perfectly and look at all that they're all gone no worries Okay, so we don't actually need this tool anymore. We will keep these around on hand for a little bit later. The next step is to fill in the wedges. And I always work outside in. So most recently I've been doing it where all of the text points, generally speaking, angling up. So we have the top facing text and then they face to the outer ring in the middle and then they face towards the inside from the bottom. You don't have to do it that way. I'll actually show both ways it's possible to do that. So what we're going to need is one of these wedges. We'll pull you to one side. We'll make you a white color for the time being. What we're just going to do is uh, rotate this by 22.5 degrees. Not like that. Like Oh, right. It needs to be half of that to give it a perfectly centered like this. And then we need a single vertical line to cover this entire thing. And the easiest way to do that is just to draw a line, center it, duplicate this, and do a path intersection again. 
Oh, it's not going to like that. Let's, let's use the rectangle tool instead. That'll work. We don't need a stroke on this. We'll do it one pixel wide. And 175 is, that's good enough. Put you there. And make sure there's nothing there. Good, good, good. Path intersection. Or really, we'll just do, uh, we'll align it centered, align it to the uh, top of the shape. And then we'll just resize this line to perfectly fit, because this is going to be our anchor point for aligning things like text. And then we're just going to, are you going to let me, let's see, we need to do that, 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 turn on all of the alignment tools, and just shrink it down to fit. That's being a little bit dodgy. I don't know what that deal is. Uh, let's see if we can figure this out real quick. That, 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 that. Really does not want to uh, extend correctly. Okay, let's try drawing a fresh rectangle because clearly that rectangle is a bad rectangle. And we'll make this a little bit wider for the time being. Do that and align it to the top. And then we just need to align it to the bottom. Are you going to play nicely? No, you're not. That is very bizarre. Can I even like snap to any of these? Yeah. Turn you off, let's turn you off and turn you on. And I should have a path intersection there. And I'll now actually just measure this and do it the lazy way. Do that. This line is 137.501 pixels, so we're going to grab that. I'm going to apply it to this shape. I'm going to do that. We don't really even need the blue rectangle. We can just work with this line, and I might even just do that for the sake of convenience. Anyway, so let's start making some wedges, and we'll grab our little tool over here. And we're actually going to be turning off the snap tool. So what we have here is just you pick a decent-looking typeface. I think I used impact for this, probably. Let's head to Neo Sans. That's that looks good enough. Uh, I believe the height was somewhere around 64 points. If we go and just measure that out, that's that's close enough. So then I just set the color of the wedge to the correct color. These colors have all been pulled from either ColorWorks or the team website or the league website. ColorWorks is a fantastic resource. Sports logos is up there too. If you just need to grab bits and pieces of shapes or logos or colors and we just duplicate this group it together rotate it once and move it into place and we just continue around the circle and pick our color duplicate group one two three align that So I'll do the entire top half, and then I'll show the two different possible ways you can do the middle half. SPR. Come on, transform. Three, four, five. There we go. And what was Phoenix? PHX. And in a nutshell, this is essentially my template here that I've made already that I just build on. And you just go in and replace the text in colors with exactly what you need. You know, you align here, there. Duplicate group. And that is those four done. 
And as a brief demonstration of how this can look, we'll set this how it is like that. And yeah, nice, big, easy to read text, gets nice and colorful. The outline stays white at the end to partially cover up some of my Inkscape related issues. There is probably a better way to do this in Illustrator, but I've never used Illustrator. I haven't used any Adobe software since I was in high school. And maybe five total hours in Photoshop back in 2010. It's been a very, very long time. So we're just going to keep making our wedges. Boop. Boop. And I'll also go in and show a little bit of how you can add in stuff like seed numbers or game scores. I found lately I've been doing that a little bit more. It tends to uh, look pretty decent. Uh, and in hockey or basketball where you have series, you can use it to indicate wins in a series. And even indicate which games a particular one in a series, or a particular team won in a series best of seven. So with this, we are now done with the outer ring. Not you. You. There we go. There are a whole bunch of other things I could put in here instead of just the team abbreviations. I've done stuff like team logos. I'd had country flags for a gold cup previously. I like the three letter abbreviations. It looks clean. It looks very simple. It's super easy to read. And I just find that this is my favorite way of doing these. So next up to do the bottom wedges, we can either just, you know, rotate this 180 degrees, refix our alignment, and just, you know, type upside down. So, like, we know here, align it. And this would be where all the logos are facing the same direction in the outside. And it would look like that. So it's like a good continuation of that target shape. Or we could do just flipping the text around and keeping the shape the way it is. So it would look like this. And this is really just down to personal preference. I honestly don't know which one I prefer. I think I can see the appeal of all the text pointing a uniform direction and just having people reading it upside down. But I also think that this looks pretty nice and having them all pointing generally upward. It's, it's really whoever is working on it can make that decision. It's a judgment call. And I don't really think I need to go in and fill all these in, but that's how I would do these. And then when you move up to a different shape, part of the uh, joy of the tools I use here is that uh, you can actually just align the next larger wedge with this smaller wedge. So did I make a duplicate? Let's make a duplicate of this. And we'll make you the exact same color. Then all you have to really do is just center it at the top. And if we drop this down a little bit, we just grab our text, group it, and it is still perfectly aligned because these wedges are not any difference in size. They're all the exact same radius. So I can make this one, and then I can go and make the one here with the exact same way. It makes updating 
the bracket later on very quick and easy. And then we just have to just add on more of these going all the way down to the middle. So if hypothetically we were saying that Reno makes it to the final and wins the whole thing, we could have these wedges. And then we just take their text here, center it in the middle, and shade the center of the color. And we'll go and put all of these in place, like so. Put you here. Put you here. Put you here. And that's how you can just add those additional wedges to the bracket. And then you're just basically just repeating that same base, that same little process 16 times, 8 times, 4 times, 2 times, and then once in the middle. So to move on to show some of the more interesting things we can do, we're going to grab this. We'll, we'll work with this Sacramento and Salt Lake City pairing up at the top here. So I'm just going to duplicate this and show some of the stuff we can do. So what I do to do something like a seed number is when these are perfectly flat like that, we use this same line again. We'll make this one, we'll make you yellow. I'm going to align you to the top and center again. And then what I do is I measure from roughly the baseline of the text to the base of the arc, which we can do by just doing this and looking at you need the bounding box of that text. And we're just going to measure to the bounding box of the text, which would be here. Doesn't seem to want to snap to bounding boxes, but we can just approximate it. So we know it's going to be somewhere like 36.741 pixels. So if we were to align something with the bottom of our text, and then measure that line perfectly, we know exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be 36.75. So this is now what we're going to need to work with is 36 0.75 pixels high and then wide enough for text so maybe 25 pixels something like that we don't need this black line that's just to get our measurement so if we align with this line center at the very bottom we'll make you yellow too then all we need is uh, all we need is the text for say a seed number so Sacramento in this particular case was an eight seed. So we could put in the eight seed and we're still using NeoSans bold and we'll set our font size to something like 22. That's plenty big enough. And when we align it, it'll look like that. And then we just grab the three elements we need and now we have an eight seed designation. Then for doing something like a score line in a game, let's say that this particular game ended with Sacramento winning by a score of eight or uh, three to two. Three to two is a perfectly cromulent soccer score line. We're going to align these or rotate these so that we have a perfectly vertical edge on the inner side. I'm going to grab our line here again. And then what I do is I align it to the top corner 
for both of them. And then we just need to basically take this same thing here. I'm going to align it like that, this little box. And then we can put in a score line of three to two. And then again, we're just grabbing the pieces we need, grouping them together. And then when we line them up, it's now a three to two score line there. Very easy, very clean. And it makes understanding what actually happened in a playoff series a little bit easier. In my NBA bracket, I actually went a little bit more complicated. And we'll pull that up real quick. Not that one, this one. Who's calling me? So if we zoom in here, we can actually see that like Toronto won one, two, three, six, or one, two, five, and six, and Washington won game three and four. And it's a very nice way of showing how we can have a seed and the games won. What I did here was I took tiny little circles and cut the text out of them. So we've got our little circles. And they don't need to be that big. I think I made them like 30 pixels or 25 pixels and put in the games. So we'll just say, we'll put in three for now. And I made this something like 25 pixels high. Oh, that's not going to quite work. Let's do 15. That's better. And then we just put these in here, cut the text out. And then I use the same exact tool over here. Only instead of aligning just the number, I'm aligning this little ball for the games. And I ended up making this about 36.75 wide as well, just to give us a little bit more room for uh, all of the different games. And I built a little jig to help build up these little game win bars of circles where I just had a, a nice little template there but it was all built with that exact same principle. And then uh, adding the seed numbers is very straightforward. Again, you can just go through and fill out the entire bracket. And once you've done all of that, what I go in and do is add in the necessary logos. So we'll go to the USL bracket again. And I used a few logos here. I used this USL Cup logo and I shrunk this to be about 150 pixels high and built a little thing that would offset it. So if it were, say, 125 pixels high and I wanted a 150 pixel space here we just grabbed the I just grabbed these numbers here and of exactly what this would be proportionally at 150 439.017 grab that put it in here and you know just group it together, drop it in the corner. That's all we really do from there. And then I just add in, I usually put the league logo in the top left, the playoff logo in the bottom right, and then my own personal logo here in the bottom left. And that's really all there is to it. And then when I go to finish it off, I export it in Inkscape at 192 DPI instead to give it a nice, bright, 
high resolution, crisp image. And there we have it. That's how I do the radio brackets. I hope you enjoyed this little look at one of my long running projects now. Maybe you'll give it a try. It's really not too hard. It's a little time consuming to set up this template, but even still, I've only been recording for 45 minutes. It's not too bad. And uh, if you enjoyed, please uh, let me know. I read every single comment I get. If you feel like sharing this with somebody else, please do. I really appreciate everybody taking the time to watch this little video here. And uh, thank you for watching.